facade, often with stucco, which was a fashionable material, not a cheap substitute for stone. The formerly utilitarian rear yards were transformed into landscape gardens, and interiors were reoriented to, to face the landscape garden. These changes were not general, have not generally been appreciated by our generation of New Yorkers, but they were widely chronicled at the time in local newspapers, in real estate and architecture journals, and in popular home magazines, such as House and Garden, House Beautiful, Vogue and Vanity Fair. So I want to introduce you this afternoon to an important movement in New York City's residential architecture, one that changed the character of several New York neighborhoods and left us with an important architectural legacy that I believe should be respected and preserved. So first, a little background. As New York's population increased in the 19th century, development pushed north up Manhattan Island and thousands of single family row houses were erected. And you can see they some, in the early years they were brick and then by the mid 19th century they were largely brownstone and we, we revere these houses today, um, but they were not always revered. By the early 20th century, these row houses had lost their cachet. They were technologically obsolete with poor plumbing little or no heat or electricity, and antiquated kitchens, and they were stylistically out of fashion. Many had been converted into rooming houses and tenements, and that's what you see here. The ones on the left in Greenwich Village are, are now rooming houses, and the ones on the right had become multiple dwellings, and in fact, the one in the middle of the picture on the right is vacant, and the sign in front of the windows is for a contractor because it's about to be redesigned in the manner that we're going to talk about um, today. The most problematic of these houses were those with brownstone fronts. The popular press and the architectural press were filled with comments reviling brownstones, monstrosities identified with the barbaric days of the city, is how the New York Tribune described brownstone houses. Other critics referred to lugubrious brownstone houses or to the terrible brownstone plague or rude how years back New York was infested with a blight known as the Brownstone Era. And most famously, Edith Wharton, looking back on her youth in New York, in her 1934 memoir, A Backward Glance, asserted that New York was cursed with its universal chocolate-colored coating of the most hideous stone ever quarried. So hardly revered. So as the city's affluent families abandoned the old row houses, where did they move? Some of the wealthiest built grand townhouses and mansions, but in the 1920s, these became too expensive for, for even many of the wealthiest families to maintain, and finding servants also became a problem. Some moved into the newly fashionable apartment houses that were erected in affluent neighborhoods throughout the city. Many people who could afford it abandoned the city altogether. Moving to burgeoning suburbs such as Scarsdale, Pelham, and Bronxville, the affluent urbanite who did not wish to live in an apartment building and did not want to resettle in the suburbs faced a dilemma. Large mansions and townhouses were too expensive to maintain and many were disappearing as their owners sold to apartment house developers. The city's smaller 19th century row houses were hopelessly old fashioned. Thus the time was right for efforts to redesign and modernize the old row houses to meet the demand for affordable modern housing in the city. The housing market was in flux and neighborhoods were rapidly changing, but still it was not clear how suitable urban housing could be created on the bleak blocks of deteriorated row houses. It was an obscure architect named Frederick Sterner who came up with a revolutionary scheme for reusing the deteriorated row houses. He, soon he was soon recognized as, quote, a father of a new period in residential design. It's hard to pin Sterner down, and his biography remains a bit obscure. He was born in England, but his father was a German who had become an American citizen before moving to England. Sterner came to America as a teenager, settling in Chicago. It's not known if he had any formal architectural training before he entered the office of an architect named Willoughby Edbrook, who sent him to Denver to work on several projects. Sterner stayed in Denver 
and developed an extremely successful practice there, working especially for the large number of English immigrants who arrived in Colorado as real estate investors. And this is a, a large mansion that Sterner designed outside of Colorado Springs for one of those railroad investors. And this is now a, um, a Christian retreat house. For unknown reasons, Sterner moved to New York in 1906. So he gives up his successful practice in Denver and moves to New York where he knew almost no one and no jobs were forthcoming. So like other architects trying to attract clients, he decided to design a house for himself that would also serve as an advertisement for his talents. Or rather, Sterner decided to redesign an old house on East 19th Street between 3rd Avenue and Irving Place, an 1840s brick row house that had become a rooming house. The location was perfect for attracting attention and publicity. We're right around the corner from Gramercy Park. We're right around the corner from the National Arts Club. So this was a, a, a place that, that uh, artists, architects, critics, possible clients uh, frequented. So, so what did Sterner do with the old house that he purchased? First, he removed the stoop and created a new main entrance in the basement. And he also removed the old cornice. And this is a picture of Sterner's house. And if you look to the, at the houses to either side, to the left and, the, and, and to the right, you can see the old rundown brick row houses. Um, that, that were there, that, Stur that Sterner is altering. So he removes the stoop, he removes the cornice, and most importantly, Sterner covered the old brick with a coating of subtly textured, unpainted, cream-colored stucco, visually what I like to call the unground stone. So it's very bright. The cream-colored stucco provided a background for more colorful ornament. Plenty of color, exclaimed Sterner. That's what we need in our architecture. We mustn't be afraid of color. We aren't Puritans anymore. Following this precept, Sterner, oops. following this precept, Sterner capped the house with a parapet that was clad in red Spanish tile, added multi-paned window sash and paneled shutters, painted a light green, built the entry stair and new areaway walls with dark red bricks and laid the entry vestibule with red quarry pile. And you can see the bricks, these burned, these are burned bricks here and here. And then there's red quarry tile over here. His most spectacular use of color was in the entrance enframement, which he surrounded with brightly glazed Moravian tiles. And you can see just how vibrant this is against the white, uh, against the cream colored uh, stucco. Sterner also incorporated tiles into the unusual molded concrete planters that he designed for the areaway walls and which are still there. The colorful facade with its light colored stucco and green, red, and blue detailing must have originally been a striking sight on a block of deteriorated red brick and brownstone houses. So the next thing that, that's, so that's the first thing that he does. The next thing that he does is he turns the utilitarian rear yard into a garden. The yards were, as one critic observed, a dreary waste from time immemorial perpetuated to the use of clotheslines and other unpicturesque sites, such as the garbage pan and the ash barrel. It's actually very difficult to find photographs of row house backyards. They were, they were utilitarian and nobody bothered to photograph them except for this Paul Strand photo that I found from, from 1917, which gives you an idea that the, yard, the yards are separated by, by basically by wooden walls. And then it's, it's basically an entirely utilitarian space. There's no landscaping uh, back here. So Sterner turns this into a garden. So instead of the wooden wall, he builds this brick wall with clinker bricks. He puts in a fountain with a Renaissance sculpture, adds more of these uh, planters with the piles uh, in them. Uh, he builds a pergola. Uh, uh, on, on the back where there was wisteria grown. So he's changed the idea, not only of what the front facade should be, but of, a, of what a backyard could be. As a, a, one critic said, you are so many miles from Broadway as if you were in a villa on an Italian mountaintop. Sterner also rethought the plan and ornamentation of the traditional New York row house, completely redesigning the interior so that it would focus on the garden. 
So I'm sure many of you have been in a traditional New York row house. And just you think you walk up the stoop and you walk into a, a hall and the stairway is straight ahead. And then to the side is the front parlor and the back has the dining room on the main floor. And then on the second floor, there is the master bedroom in the front and another bedroom in the back. And on the upper floors, there are smaller bedrooms. And in the basement, there is a sort of a, a, a room in the front that you could use as a, a, a everyday dining room or a library or a billiard room or whatever you wanted. And the, the kitchen is in the rear facing the utilitarian garden. But here's what Stoner does. He turns the house basically inside out. So on the ground floor, the kitchen, this is the street here on the bottom. The ground floor, the kitchen has been moved to the front. So there's the kitchen and the butler's pantry. There's the main entrance. And in the back of the ground floor is the dining room overlooking the garden. And on the upper floor is the drawing room, the library, and Sterner's architectural studio are all in the back facing the garden. And there's a series of bedrooms and servants' rooms in the front. So he's completely changed the front, the garden, and the plan of the house. And then the, the um, Cerner's interior design <clears throat> combined a radical revision of the plan with the fashionable and conservative medieval English-inspired decoration that he had previously used in his Colorado work. He was very, he was very much an Anglophile. Uh, and I think on his interiors, he used a mix of antique and modern antique uh, furnishings. And you can see this is the dining room and there's the, the sculpture out in the garden. Um, is, is visible here. And the dining room has the red quarry tile from, from the entrance vestibule continues onto the interior. So Sterner moved in here with his sister, uh, Maud Sterner. Um, Sterner never married. Uh, he, he lived with his sister. Uh, in fact, they lived in five different houses that Sterner redesigned. We'll see one other one uh, in a few minutes. And they moved from house to house. And when, when Maud Sterner got married to an Englishman, and moves to London, Sterner closes his office uh, and moves to London as well, and he dies in London. The house, by the way, the rehabilitation of this house cost $12,000, and it was a huge success, even greater than anything Sterner could have imagined. It got an enormous amount of press, um, and, and in, the public, in, in newspapers, in magazines, in architecture magazines, Sterner's house had an immediate impact on his professional career, resulting in a series of commissions from a group of wealthy, socially well-connected, and artistically inclined New Yorkers, including a number of artists on 19th Street. So here you can see 19th Street, which became known as the Block Beautiful. So the third house from the left, this one where my cursor is, that's Sterner's house. This is a new facade that Sterner designed, this sort of English um, Tudor design, this a, uh, is a new facade that Sterner designed on an old house. He basically ripped off the entire front facade and built a new one. And then this is an alteration that Sterner did, but he left the brick. And then there's one, two, three, four more stucco facades that he did on this, on this block. So here's one of them. This was uh, the house for Beatrice Chandler and her husband, William Astor Chandler. Beatrice Chandler was well known in the early 20th century as Minnie Ashley, a, a chorus girl. Uh, and she caught the attention of William Astor Chandler and they married and she became a sculptor. Uh, and they purchased this house and Sterner redesigned the facade again with a stucco front and Moravian tile by the entrance. And here you can see one of the tiles. And when I was working on this book, this was the one that was completely intact. I don't know whether it's still intact. Uh, the, the woman who owned it has died since uh, I visited. Uh, and I, I know it was purchased by a very successful artist whom I told about the house, but I don't know if they've kept it and restored it or have, have altered it. So this is, you can see the interior uses old English design, uh, wood paneling, uh, this uh, uh, an arched, a segmental arch, aster ceiling, uh, this is the parlor on the, the, the second level. This is the stair and the dining room on the first, on the ground floor. And this is the studio on the top where, where, where Beatrice Chandler worked with this uh, fireplace that, that Sterner uh, designed. And there are painted glass windows with, with flowers 
uh, in the dining room overlooking the garden. And on the, in the parlor, there are the coats of arms of prominent universities, including, I'm happy to say, Columbia um, here. And you, this will look familiar, uh, this clinker brick uh, rear yard with a trellis and a fountain. The writer for a New York Sun reported that 19th Street has become one of the most interesting and artistic bits of real estate in New York, and then presciently noted a promise of this type of reclamation to transform the whole ugly city into a livable, lovable place. While Sterner's model for reclaiming old row houses did not transform the whole city, it did have a major impact on several old neighborhoods, first on the east side. Sterner was not content with his single example of a revitalized block, so he looked for other deteriorated old houses that could be purchased inexpensively and redesigned. Another home would bring even more publicity. By 1914, he settled on a pair of old brownstone fronts on East 63rd Street between Lexington and 3rd Avenues. This was the first of four houses that Sterner and his sister Maud would live in on the east side over the next several years. The location of the project was significant in the history of housing and neighborhood development in New York. That is, it's, it is east of Park Avenue. The rail cut along Park Avenue had created a dividing line on the east side with the wealthy to the west and less affluent households to the east. With the covering of the railroad tracks in the first years of the 20th century, Park Avenue suddenly became a street of luxury apartment houses and mansions. Real estate on the blocks farther east remained inexpensive, but these blocks were close to the homes of the city's wealthiest and most prominent families they wouldn't remain run down for long. Sterner's project pioneered in the redevelopment of this area. Sterner's East 63rd Street project was more elaborate and complex than his earlier work on 19th Street. Every detail of the unfashionable facades was stripped away. And here you can see, speaking out on the left, you can see one of what the old brownstone looked like uh, before Sterner removed every evidence of of that old house uh, from, from the facade. In the place of the old details, Sterner created a restrained stucco facade with flat planes. So it's a, a subtly textured, unpainted, buff or cream colored stucco. The window frames uh, were painted green. Uh, there's red, that burned red brick that he likes down here in the gate, in the, uh, uh, along the areaway. He's added iron guards in front of the windows, and he's created an artist's studio at the top, which was not his own studio. He actually rented out the upper floor uh, to, to an artist. Uh, and uh, this house, by the way, still stands, but unfortunately, the ground floor has been completely altered, and a, a new front has been built out to the, the street level, and the studio window has been filled in. So basically, the only thing that survives are the iron window guards um, today. The entrance was very complex. It uses these uh, the overburned bricks. It has a red brick paving, and it incorporates spolia. That is, these uh, pieces of Renaissance sculpture. Uh, and there are a number of buildings in which Sterner incorporates older pieces of sculpture um, in, into the design. The plan, again, turns the house inside out. The kitchen is now facing the street, and the dining room faces what he calls the open court uh, here. And the drawing room on the next floor also faces the garden. And in the back, he built himself an office. So this was his private office, and this was his draftsman's room uh, on the second floor. And the interior uses the, um, the old English designs that, 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 um, that Sterner favored. Uh, Vogue said that the interior, that the dining room, which you see on the left, had the quality of an ancient inn. And then here's the courtyard garden that was the, the central focus of the house. And here you can see Sperner and Maud uh, sitting out in the garden. This is actually the only known image of Frederick Sterner. 
Vogue was enthusiastic, not only about the design of the house and garden, but about the precedent setting nature of the work. Hoping that they said, the people who live near can have no other desire than to follow the lead and create a new neighborhood in the city. Vogue's hopes would not be disappointed. Over the next decade, almost every house on Stoner's East 63rd Street block, as well as many houses on nearby blocks, were redesigned in a similar way. Stoner actually became a financial investor on the block, purchasing several houses on the north side of the street, redesigning them, and then placing them on the market. Unlike the original brownstone facades, which were identical in each row, each of Stoner's facades was a unique design. Roof lines varied with stepped gables, mansards, and diaper pattern parapets, while stucco fronts were articulated with different types of brickwork, iron balconies, flower boxes, different window patterns, and handsome brick entrances set behind areaway walls and iron railings. Unfortunately, very few of these survived. All, of course, had gardens in place of utilitarian yards. In the 1920s, Sterner became more and more interested in what I call oldie English design, as is evident in his final house that he did for himself and his sister, Parge House. In 1921, Sterner purchased an 1870 brownstone fronted row house on Lexington Avenue at the southwest corner of East 65th Street. And here you can see, just again, peeking out on the left, what the brownstone row house looked like originally. At this corner site, Sterner would create his most striking exterior. As would be expected, all the projecting elements were removed and the facade was covered in cream colored stucco with contrasting red brick trim. And you can see the red brick trim here at an entrance, here at a secondary entrance and here um, along the side street. The most extraordinary aspect of the exterior design, a detail guaranteed to draw attention to the building, was Sterner's extensive use of three-dimensional pargetry. Pargetry is the English folk practice popular in the 16th and 17th centuries in East Anglia, that's the area that is, that's uh, northeast of London, of creating decorative stucco work, particularly three-dimensional ornament, such as vines, garlands, animals, figures, and mythological creatures. And one summer, I went what I call pargeting. That is, we drove around Essex and elsewhere in East Anglia looking for uh, houses with pargetry. And these are two of the great masterpieces from the latter part of the 17th century, the Sun Inn in Saffron Walden and the Sparrow House uh, in Ipswich, uh, both from the 1670s. This um, image down here, this is, each of these windows has an as an image of one of the four continents. And this is America uh, with a, a rather uh, stylized Native American and a dog. Argetry appears to have been used for the first time in New York City by Sterner. The ornament consists of lively panels with swirling vines, Tudor symbols, and whimsical beasts, heads, and female figures. And you can see there are heads, vines, uh, all kinds of wonderful details um, in here. And over the, the entrance on the side street, it says Parge House, 1921, amidst some targeted foliage here. And this, um, this is the entrance on, on the side street. And this, when I first uh, visited here, this was painted white. And the owner of the house uh, let me come in, gave me a tour of the interior of the house. And I showed her some old pictures and I explained to her that one of Sterner's ideas was the contrast between the dark red brick and the, the, the white stucco. Uh, and and uh, within a year or two, she had had the paint removed from all the brick. Uh, and so now you can see that contrast um, again. Sterner's interest in old English design. Um, oh, so, so, uh, so here you can see the, uh, the interior continues the use of, of, of old English uh, features, some of which I think are antique and some of which are modern um, antiques, uh, antique looking uh, items. Most of Sterner's projects have been located between Lexington and Third Avenues. It remained 
as one critic noted, for a few people of courage and vision to penetrate beyond Third Avenue and convert the shabby, narrow brownstones of that district into Italian villas and French masonettes and little London houses. Beginning in 1919, some prominent and wealthy New Yorkers took up the new cry of Eastwood Ho by purchasing old houses east of Lexington Avenue, especially between Third and Second Avenues in the East Sixties. Many of these are now in the Treadwell Farm Historic District, which is where we started with that house that had been altered. Frederick Sterner's idea, and here you can see two examples. On the left is uh, one of Sterner's designs, uh, and this, is, this remains intact. And on the right, also extant today, is the home of, that the architect Amar Embury Jr. At, uh, redesigned for himself and his wife, the landscape architect Ruth Dean, who did the backyard. Um, uh, and so, and both of these are stucco fronted buildings. And the picture on the left really gives you that sense of the contrast between the dark old brownstone and the new brightly colored, uh, uh, cream colored stucco. Frederick Sterner's idea of creating rear yard gardens became a, a key element of the rehabilitated row houses of the post World War I period. In the early 20th century, these gardens were anomalies in New York's landscape, picturesque oases set amidst a sea of bleak utilitarian black backyards that were, according to one critic writing in 1916, in barbarous disarray and often in a frightfully unsanitary condition. In contrast, garden critic Lucy Hubble commented only a few years later that the term city garden has been transformed from an absur absurd anomaly into a familiar term of everyday speech. So here are just a, a few of these gardens on the east side. So, you know, they're relatively narrow. The houses are mostly about 20 feet wide, some a little less, maybe a, a few a little bit more. Uh, and so the, the old wooden walls were taken down uh, and walls of, of brick or stucco were built often with wooden trellises on the top, as you can see on these two upper images. Uh, there's a lot of hardscape that is brick and, and stone paving. Uh, and, and at the end of the garden, there's almost always a focal point, a sculpture or a, fo like, uh, or a fountain like you see here, uh, that would focus your eye. And they use theatrical effects to make these spaces look larger than, than they were. Also, the spaces tended to be divided in two, with a terrace immediately adjoining the house, as you see here, and then the garden itself. Most of these wealthy families had summer houses, so they, these gardens were not designed for the summer. They were designed with evergreens, of, uh, so they'd be interesting in the winter, and for spring and fall uh, plantings. If the individual gardens added immeasurably to the quality of these new urban houses, a more expansive community garden created by removing the walls altogether and landscaping a larger area would be even more desirable. This was the argument behind the creation of several community garden projects just after World War I, most evidently at Turtle Bay Gardens, a project of New York and Newport social leader Charlotte Walton, who in 1919 acquired 21 dwellings on East 48th and 49th Streets between 2nd and 3rd Avenues and hired architects Edward Clarence Dean and William Lawrence Bottomley to redesign the houses and combine the gardens, creating an extraordinary complex. So each facade, each street was designed differently. This one, uh, 49th Street with its gables, 48th Street with its sort of uh, London townhouse uh, kind of look. And then the walls were removed and a common garden was created. The owners actually got to keep most of their rear yards and the center section was deeded to a community group, but there were rules. Uh, you couldn't build walls, you couldn't uh, build high hedges to block yours off. So the fountains and the water courses and all the other features of the garden would be visible to everybody. And you can see they built, he built, they built these low walls with garden gates and this remains largely intact uh, today and as has attracted lots of, of, of famous people, including, especially in the arts over the years. Catherine Hepburn had a house here for decades, 
Stephen Sondheim has lived here for decades um, as, as well. Sudden Place uh, was, was also an example of this. Sudden Place was the first of several 1920s projects that transformed the East River waterfront from a working class and industrial area to a prestigious residential strip. Now this Sudden Place was not a uniform redesign. The project was, all the buildings on the, the Sutton Place block were purchased together, uh, but then they were sold by, their, by the developer with a, uh, a covenant that required that each owner redesign both the front and rear facades within two years of the purchase. So the brownstone fronts were either stripped and stuccoed in the sterner manner, and you can see that here to the left, or they were recovered in brick, as you can see on, on, on the right. The, um, the, the genesis of this project remains ambiguous. I believe that the investors were a front for the Phipps estate. The Phippses were very wealthy uh, steel uh, 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 family. They did a lot of building. And I think that the Phipps tried to turn the East River waterfront into a fashionable neighborhood so that they could invest in apartment buildings. Uh, and once this becomes successful, the Phipps do indeed build several of the most prestigious apartment buildings on Sutton Place. This was the most improbable location for a, a, um, a residential area for, for the very wealthy. There was a, the Dolger Brewery was to the south. There was a coal yard across the street. The Queensboro Bridge and its attendant traffic noise was out the back window, and a brand new power plant built by the New York Steam Corporation was uh, had just been completed, or was just being completed to the north. In fact, the owners of the the, the power plant were a little worried that they were going to have a problem with these with wealthy people moving in, complaining about the presence of the steam plant. So they agreed to try to uh, keep the soot down. And they hosted what had to have been one of the strangest luncheons in the history of New York. Lewis Sherry created, uh, Lewis Sherry catered a luncheon for all of the new homeowners on Sutton Place in the boiler room of the power plant. The sales were slow initially until, um, until um, Elizabeth Marbury, the, uh, the theatrical agent, and, and her partner, uh, the interior decorator, Elsie DeWolf, purchased this house over here uh, and uh, uh, restuccoed the front. And then a series of, especially of single women, uh, Ann Vanderbilt, Ann Morgan, and others, uh, and, and others um, purchased these houses and had them redesigned. And in fact, there were a uh, one gossip columnist referred to uh, a rumor of sapphic revels going on um, in, in these houses. The, uh, and the garden was combined. And here you can see the rear facades of several of the houses and the garden, which was, re which was combined and landscaped by a landscape architect named Nellie Allen. Women played a major role in the creation of the new East Side Residential District. So we just saw Nellie Allen, the, the, the landscape architect. Charlotte Martin sponsored and largely funded Turtle Bay Gardens. And wealthy single women, including Ann Vanderbilt, Ann Morgan, and Elizabeth Marbury, commissioned the design of new houses on Sutton Place and created the community's unique social ambiance. Women also commissioned the redesign of many individual houses on the East Side even when their husbands owned the property. Contemporary discussions often credit these women with the design of the interiors and gardens. It is, of course, not surprising that so many women were involved with the creation of these houses, since in the early decades of the century, the home was still considered the, women's, the woman's realm. As Dorothy Draper, a prominent interior decorator who lived in a house on East 63rd Street, designed by Frederick Sterner, noted, it is a well-recognized fact that it is usually the woman of the family who has the determining vote in the choosing of the home. What is more noteworthy is the number of professional women who are key figures in the redesign of these East Side houses, including architect Josephine Wright Chapman, interior designers such as Draper and Elsie DeWolf, 
and landscape designers such as Marion Coffin, Ruth Dean, and Nellie Allen. In addition, women photographers such as Maddie Edwards Hewitt and Frances Benjamin Johnson documented these houses. And you can see a, a Frances Benjamin Johnson image on the top right and a Maddie Hewitt image on the bottom left. And uh, Johnson and Hewitt actually were a couple uh, for, for, for a while. And the gardens, um, and also the, the, um, the houses and gardens were written up in popular design and, and society magazines, often in articles that were written by women critics. And a lot of the quotes that I've been reading were by women critics uh, commenting on these kinds of designs. Some of these articles were on what used to be known as the women's pages in the newspapers, but others were in uh, architecture uh, magazines or in House and Garden and House Beautiful and Vogue and Vanity Fair and Town and Country and Country Life, which hired uh, women writers uh, to do a lot of their articles about individual houses. There is a larger urban issue uh, here, though, and that is displacement, largely of immigrant households. Uh, and indeed, these rehabilitation projects probably mark the first instance in New York City of what has come to be known as gentrification. A New York Tribune headline announcing that Diamondbacks now rub elbows with lowly folks in expanding Upper East Side vividly express the social conditions in the newly popular neighborhoods. And one critic quipped that on Sutton Place, the Vanderbilts and Morgans and Judy O'Grady have become sisters under the stucco. This displacement was generally overlooked in the exuberant coverage about the newly designed row houses. Thus, it is startling to read the opening paragraph of critic Frank Brown's extensive article about remodeling published in July 1921 in the mainstream architectural record, which pointedly describes the impact of remodeling on less wealthy people. Brown explained in his prof to his professional audience in an otherwise celebratory article that as the wealthy moved to the Far East Side, they encroached upon property that has previously been put to much more populous use so that as the better off solved their own housing problem, they will but increasingly complicate the problems of many others and those of a class far less able to take care of themselves. Defenders of the movement noted that they were improving the neighborhoods by modernizing obsolete houses that were otherwise destined for demolition. Although many poor, largely immigrant families were displaced by the rehabilitation projects, the population did not completely change immediately. And the new owners often lived side by side with immigrants in rooming houses and tenements. In her 1924 book, American Homes of Today, the reactionary writer Augusta Owen Patterson noted the presence of a semi-alien lower class whose presence needed to be considered when planning a city house. For Patterson, the newly renovated houses focused on the rear garden and not the street, became refuges from the unfriendly, heterogeneous city. So you know, with, by putting all the rooms facing the garden in the back, you're, you're sort of turning your back on, on the, the, the life of, of the city. The redesign of row houses was not limited to artistic neighborhoods like Gramercy Park or social centers such as the Far East Side, but also appeared in Sorry, also appeared in Bohemian Greenwich Village. Uh, and this is really the, the, the transformation of the housing market in Greenwich Village in the second decade of the 20th century was initiated by one real estate developer, a man named uh, Vincent Pepe. And it mostly included the turning of old deteriorated row houses into artist studios, uh, which were not necessarily for artists. Um, but I, I, this is a whole nother lecture, so I'm not going to go into Greenwich Village, but I just wanted to introduce the fact that, that this, this, this idea that Sterner originates um, moves to Greenwich Village. And in fact, Pepe said that Sterner inspired this, but he then turns them into uh, uh, housing for people who wanted to live like artists. In fact, I call the chapter in my book, The Real Estate of Bohemia. 
uh, because he was into turning these into apartments that would be then rented at a profit. And this, on the left, you see the pioneering uh, building in in in, um, in Greenwich Village that was re that was turned into six apartments, uh, and the, the the windows were enlarged to create artist studio windows. The facade was stuccoed. There were hoods with red Spanish tile in them. And here you can see other examples on Eighth Street. There's a studio there, a studio there, and there are three studios here. But all of these actually still survive uh, on, on 8th Street. But that's the subject of another lecture. As I discovered in the early decades of the 20th century, hundreds of 19th century row houses were modernized and redesigned for middle class and affluent urbanites. Critics of the day noted that these projects had transformed and enlivened the streetscapes in several neighborhoods. In the post-World War II period, many of the redesigned row houses were demolished. Others were disfigured. Sadly, this destruction has not really stopped. Even buildings that are landmarked continued to be destroyed. Uh, this is the Isabella Greenway House that was designed by William Lawrence Bottomley, one of the architects of Turtle Bay Gardens. And uh, this house was a little bit deteriorated uh, uh, some, a few years ago, and it received, but it was intact. It received a new owner, and the new owner decided that they wanted to upgrade the building. So they took Sterner's, a real Sterner design with stucco on the front, and they recreated it in limestone. Uh, so now we have a kind of faux uh, William Lawrence Bottomley design rather than Bottomley's original uh, design in, in, in stucco. And even while I was working on my project, buildings were demolished. This is Lexington Avenue and 65th Street on the south east corner right across from the Parge House, and here it is on the right being demolished. My book has examined how the movement to redesign row houses in New York was a significant development of the early decades of the 20th century. This movement was widely appreciated at the time. Writers and critics understood that they were witnessing the transformation of many of the city's rundown areas and that these physical changes reflected changes in patterns of urban residential life. Thus, an appreciation of the history of these houses is essential to an understanding of the evolution of urban residential life and the preservation of surviving examples of this movement celebrates an important and hitherto underappreciated development in early 20th century urban architecture. So thank you. So I am happy to answer questions. I'm going to turn the PowerPoint off. Um, and what I'm hoping everybody will do is turn on their video. One of the things I, I like about doing these, these, um, uh, uh, these Zoom lectures is it, it gives us a sense to connect, something that we've really lost. Uh, and if people turn it on, at least we can see each other. Um, and, and who's there, we can wave at each other, uh, whatever. So it gives, I think, some sense of social connection. So if you have questions, uh, if you use the raise your hand, either I can call on you or, or, or uh, Franny or Felicia or Lara uh, can call on you. Um, and when you ask your question, you have to unmute yourself. So I can't see all the people that are, are, uh, are here, so I don't know how many... Um, Hands are up. So I see lots Am I unmuted? Yes, Franny, you're unmuted. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to claim privilege here as the president of the Friends of the Upper East Side and thank Andrew so very, very much for this lecture. Um, I love these stories. And I think, to me, the conclusion about displacement is new. I don't remember that from before. And it uh, resonated quite a lot with me tonight. So thank you for that new thought. You always get new thoughts from Andrew, new thoughts and new looks. Um, thanks also to those of you who had to wait a little while to get on. We apologize. Zoom failed us a little bit. We knew we had a large number, but uh, they didn't quite connect with us. But I hope you enjoyed it. And now carry on with the questions. Thank you. All right. Um, so I see a lot of people have not, uh, have not turned their video, have not turned their video on. All right. We have a question from Chris. Chris, I'm going to unmute you. Chris, you're now unmuted. Hi, um, this is Chris and Olivia um, in Troy, New York. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Chris and Olivia. <laughs> Thanks so much for a wonderful talk and a wonderful book, which I relied on heavily when I worked at the Landmarks Commission. Um, so I, my question is, um, 
kind of general, but um, so the Secretary of the Interior standards, which are the federal preservation guidelines, um, do absolutely acknowledge the concept of significant later alterations to historic buildings. Um, so I wonder if you, Andrew, could comment on um, the way that the Landmarks Commission regulates um, this class of building and, um, you know, how maybe they could approach it a little differently so that, you know, these great examples don't continue to get uh, restored, but really actually destroyed. Well, um, no, I think what, what you say is really interesting. I think that, that uh, previously, um, People looked at these buildings as alterations, not at, in, the, in, the, in the most negative way. And if you read, the, for example, um, the Treadwell Farm Historic District Designation Report, Treadwell Farm was one of the first historic districts designated by the city. That's East 61st and East 62nd Streets between 2nd and 3rd Avenues. It refers to it as this quaint neighborhood of 1870s row houses. and and. This is how I got involved in this. I would look at Treadwell Farm and I said, and would say, this is not an eight, not 1870 row houses. These are all altered. And suddenly I became interested in the alterations. And it turned out that about 80% of the houses in that historic district were altered between 1919 and 1921. So clearly something was going on. So in the past, the the, the Landmarks Commission was allowing the these, these to be re restored back to their 19th century look. And there were cases in Greenwich Village where the Landmarks Commission was giving permits to remove the artist's studio windows. I think that that has changed, but not completely. I mean, they, 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 they were persuaded that, that that bottomly house could have a limestone facade instead of a stucco house. But last week, they rejected, actually, ironically, another bottomly house came up with a stucco front and facade a stucco alteration, and they rejected the proposal uh, to turn it into stone. But a couple of years ago, um, they allowed somebody, one of the key elements of this design, and it's something that takes us New Yorkers a little effort to get our heads around, is that a key element of this is the removal of the stoops. Um, and the, a really great example um, in, in Greenwich Village that they, um, they permitted somebody to put a stoop back on uh, and, and I actually went to the commission and spoke against it, but uh, to no avail. Uh, because putting the stoop back on changed the whole idea of what they were trying to do with this house. Um, so the house is completely restored to its its look in, in, in the 19 teens, except that it now has a stoop on it. So I think things are changing. There is now an appreciation that, this, that these are uh, something that's, that are worthwhile. Thanks. So, other questions? Mark Robinson, you have raised your hand, and I um, unraise your unmuted now. Wait, unmuted. Great. Hi. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, I have kind of a, a layman's question for you. What does the term brownstone really mean? Is it a literal meaning, or where does it come from? Well, the. Uh, Brownstone um, is, is a, a type of sandstone that was, was largely quarried in Portland, Connecticut and shipped by water to New York. And because it was easy to get here, became enormously popular in the mid 19th century from the mid 1840s uh, through the 1880s. Uh, and so um, it's a material, but it has become, it became so popular in New York that in the colloquial, New Yorkers refer to all row houses as brownstones. So it doesn't matter if it's limestone or, or, or brick, they ref, New Yorkers refer to them as brownstones. And I know there are a few of my former students um, here, and, if you, if, and they all know that they cannot refer to row houses as brownstones. That to us, a brownstone is just the material. Thank you. Uh, we have Erin Brown. I am going to mute you. Uh, yeah, I'm one of those aforementioned uh, former students. Uh, I have a question. I was shocked about how many of those row houses have um, those historic English, uh, have the uh, English interiors. 
And I was curious to what extent were they old? You mentioned it briefly that part of them may have been old rooms and to what extent were they ever new recreated rooms? And then on top of that, you know, this idea that potentially some of them were brought over from England, what was their own view of, of history and what they were doing to these buildings? So, um, I don't, I don't know the answer to that a hundred percent. I have not found any examples of entire rooms being moved from England to one of these houses, which is something that did occur. There was a lot of rooms that were removed from English houses and put up for sale. And there was a huge market for that uh, in America. Uh, and a lot of them, Fifth Avenue and Park Avenue mansions or apartments uh, had rooms from English and French uh, houses. But I do believe that some of the woodwork, uh, for example, um, in the parge, that, that, that vertical stair rail, um, I believe is, is, is a, a medieval uh, piece. Uh, and so I think that there, were, that there was the market for this and that some owners were buying some of this and that Sterner was combining old and, new, and, and old real antiques and modern antiques um, in, in the interior, uh, on the interiors. And I'm not clear what you meant by the second part uh, of, of this. You, are you asking what did the English think about this? No, no. I mean, the homeowners, to, to any extent that they were bringing these rooms over, they obviously then had the reference for history. How did they feel then about taking apart these row houses or brownstones or recreating them? Uh, you know, was there any problem? Kind of blight. You know, those, those brownstones uh, were, were considered a blight. Um, and so they were, they saw themselves as improving the neighborhoods where they were, where they were working. All right, uh, Mr. Spence, I'm going to unmute you now. Well, I'm Chanel Spence. I'm the chairman of the Landmarks Committee for CB2. And um, I appreciate very much so much information about brownstones. Um, interestingly, we're seeing a great... Is... Why you froze, so could you start again? I'm sorry? You, your voice froze, can you start again? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, um, I would say that um, the, the important thing was that we're seeing a great restoration of stoops, or rebuilding of stoops, when have the stoops been removed. Do you know or have an opinion about why so few relocated the, the entrance to grade level rather than keeping the steps down. Um, so you're asking why did they remove the stoops? No, why, why, um, when, once they were removed, were the entrances not made at grade level rather than keeping the, the several steps? Oh, I, I think, I see, when, for most of these, as we saw on Sterner's house, in order to get into the house, you have to go down a few stairs. And that was, you know, to move, to move it up to grade level would be a major structural change to the house. Uh, and it would also have meant that the ceiling height in, at the basement level uh, would have become quite low. Uh, so, uh, so they, 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 um, you have to go down in order to have the full height of, of the room. And these, these were one of the, the, the issues with these houses were that it was marketed as a, a relatively low cost way to get a new uh, up to date, uh, fashionable house. So they weren't, uh, they weren't, they didn't want to spend huge amounts of money doing complete reconstructions. So they, so although they altered the facade, they altered the garden, they altered the exterior, they kept the structure of the building. So they kept the floors and the walls of, of the old house. Right. Um, Donna, I am going to unmute um, you. Okay, thank you. Hi, Andrew. Very Good nice welcome. talk. Um, so to, to my modern eyes anyway, it seems to me like what Sterner and the others did to the facades was you know, very streamlined and modern. 
Um, whereas the in inside decoration was antique and, and old and old fashioned. Did it seem the same way to them? Uh, you know, this seems like a sort of a contradiction to me in what the, the sensibilities were. Um, or was that just two separate independent kind of trends? So I agree with you um, that, that there, there does seem to be a disconnect between the, the relative simplicity of the exterior and the ye olde English look of the interiors. And, and I mean, what I showed you, Sterners are very English. There are other examples that are French or Italian. But when they described the exteriors, they didn't describe them as modern. They described them as, as Mediterranean. Uh, so that they were harking back to, to the use of light-colored stucco on Mediterranean villas. Uh, so, so they saw the exteriors as, as historical um, as well. And it did not bother people at the time that you might have a, 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 an Italian Mediterranean exterior and an old English interior. Um, that was very common to mix styles in the same building. Um, but, but there is a, a contrast, I think, between the simplicity of the exterior and the, and the, 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 um, the decorative quality and the, 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 the overtly um, antiqued uh, image of the exterior, of the interior. Yeah, all the ornamentation. The Italian garden in the back. Yeah. All right. Um, we received a few questions on the chat, and instead of reading them out loud, I'm going to call the people and unmute them so they can ask them. Bertie uh, Schnatter, I'm going to unmute you. Um, you are now unmuted. I, I <clears throat> tried to get the video on, but it says the host is blocking me. Um, All right. I I, I'm asking just for a uh, citation for the, the Patterson book. Um, the Modern House or something? Oh, the, the, uh, the Patterson book is called American Homes of Today, and it was published in 1924. And it's a very, it's a very interesting read. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jim, let me find you for one second. Oh, it seems like Jim had left has left the meeting. Um, I also have a question from Charles. Uh, one second. Hi. Hi, Charles. Hi. Hi. Uh, great, great presentation. Dora can see these things. <laughs> um, my question related to, uh, I know we're focused on the Upper East Side because that is the group that's sponsoring this. I'm just, there were parallel developments like on the Upper West Side by similar architects at the same time or was Sterner Moore the pioneer in the city? So there are, there are three neighborhoods where there are significant concentrations of these. In Gramercy Park, uh, on, the, on the Far East Side, and in Greenwich Village. Uh, on the Upper West Side, there is exactly one example of this uh, on, on 77th Street off of West End Avenue. Frederick Sterner got a commission uh, there. And there are two spectacular examples in Brooklyn Heights that were designed by a local Brooklyn architect from uh, Slee and Bryson that are, are incredible ripoffs of Sterner's. Uh, design and one of the one of the issues involved here was that they're in neighborhoods that were convenient to the newly developing downtown in, in Midtown. Uh, so part part of the argument for this is they're 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 um, reclaiming these neighborhoods where people could convenient to their offices and walk work to walk to work or walk to the shops um, or the theater. Uh, so the East Side and Gramercy Park were really good for that, for that kind of use. The Upper West Side at the time was a, a neighborhood that was um, where the row houses were, being, were deteriorating and being demolished. And for the most part, they were not being rediscovered. 
And I thought it's a really interesting anomaly that this did not sweep through the west side uh, mm. like it did the east side. There is the, the example on the Sterner's building on the west side is really beautiful and, and on the exterior at least completely intact. Uh, just as a follow up question, World War One. World War One. Did it have any? Um, World War One. Did it have any impact? Well, the only the only impact uh, World War One had was that during World War One, development stops. Uh, but um, after World War One, there was a severe housing shortage uh, in New York, uh, and that was you know the the critic from the architectural record who's commenting on uh, the the uh, the 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 so-called gentrification notes that the, the wealthy were solving their housing problem. It was very hard for people of all classes to find places to live because there hadn't been any construction for a few years. Lots of people had come to New York during World War I, and so there was a housing crisis. Um, and so there, there were a number of responses to that. One was the first time New York has rent control is after World War I. Uh, and another was a, a significant number of these wealthy people start moving to to the far east side. Um, so that's the that's the one impact that World War One has. Thank you. We have a question from from Carol Engel. I'm going to unmute you. Um, just one second. Carol, you're unmuted. Hi. Hi. How are you? So, yeah, my question was about um, 224 E61st Street. I was actually curious to know whether or not you've actually been in that building since it's been renovated. Uh, no, I have not. Yeah. Um, so it's funny because I live on a, in a house on E77th Street, and um, the house on E61st that you first spoke about is a friend of mine's home. Oh. And, I've, you know, they did a gut renovation because I guess at some point in time it was turned into multifamily. And there were several apartments when they purchased it. We've been in our house 20 years, so I want to say about 22 years ago. And it's quite fascinating what they did with the home. Well, I know it had been altered a long time ago. That, that um, the, 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 the exterior alteration has been there as long as I can remember. Um, so, so I never got to see that house. So the, um, the, the interior of Sterner's house by about six months, um, a new owner had gutted it just before I got in touch with, with them. And she gave me a tour of the interior, but there was nothing left. Well, I'm happy to connect you with the current owner. I actually, as when you when you started the presentation, I called her, and um, I said, "You're not going to believe this. Your house is, is on this presentation, you know, okay. in the book. But this same um, contractor that did the exterior restoration to her house did the restoration to my house. And although I'm not landmarked, I tried to maintain the integrity of the um, original design of the house. And the stoop was removed in the '60s." Um, so I try to reconfigure it so that actually the ground floor door was more of a front entry. Mm -hmm. so. But it's fascinating, and thank you for sharing with you with okay. us. Um, I don't see any um, raise hand. Oh, I do. I'm sorry, uh, Je Jeremy. I am going to unmute you. Okay, thank you. Hi, hey, Jeremy. Oh. Jeremy. Jeremy's muted now. Yeah. How's that? Oh, good. There you go. Um, my question is that there are obviously um, thousands, if not tens of thousands, of uh, brownstones throughout the city that have been stripped and restuccoed with brownstone stucco. Sometimes the stoops are removed, sometimes the cornices are removed. Do you see any relationship between those and the houses you've been speaking of? Are, are they just developers, cheap imitations of what was done by Sterner and others? Or 
are they something else altogether and we shouldn't be concerned about proposals to actually restore their original features? So I think they, that that is the most complicated question that relates to, to my research uh, here. I do not advocate that every altered row house should be preserved in its altered state. What I advocate is that we ask the question of was there a design intent or a social intent in the alteration that is worth uh, preserving? And that there are lots of examples where uh, a, a, a developer came along and just stripped all the ornament because it was deteriorated and it was easier to strip the ornament than to restore it. Uh, and that there was no aesthetic intent uh, in, involved. And in those cases, I think it's perfectly fine to restore the, the, the exterior um, or to put the stoop back. But where it was, where there was, where, where it was part of, of a design intent to recreate a new kind of housing in New York, I think that we need to stop and ask the question and in many cases say, no, these are really important to the creation of these neighborhoods. And, and, and uh, we, should, uh, we should advocate for the preservation of this important early 20th century uh, development. I think that this is a, a, you know, people can debate this issue of, of you know, do we ever, um, it was like um, uh, the, the first question that noted the, the Secretary of the Interior Standards and this appreciation of change that occurs over time. And I think it's really important that we stop and ask the, the right questions about that. All right. Thank you. Um, Julianne, uh, you are now unmuted. Yeah, okay. I was going to say thank you very much, Andrew, and I was going to comment about the house in Treadwell Farm on 64th Street, that there actually was two different facades that you can find, one from the 1930s, I think, where they actually had uh, a fair amount of detail. And I too am very familiar with the homeowner of that. And when you come to Treadwell Farm, we'd be happy to have you uh, meet many of our neighbors that have these homes. But it does appear that there's been more than one major renovation on the exterior to that house over time. And I don't know the details of who did what when, except for the current homeowner who did her work back in, I think, 1992 or 1993. And it was a multifamily home. Um, and the front actually had big pillars with big balls on top of them um, that really distinguished sort of the front area of it. And there's some easy photographs that I could share with you on that as well. Great. Thank you. And the other home in that photograph was actually designed at, by somebody who did the work on behalf of Oscar de la Renta. That home that was in that, you had the two slides side by side, and it looked like it had a multi colored front and a little bit of finials up on a higher level and shingle uh, shutters that was done at some point um, commissioned uh, for Oscar de Laurenta who lived there probably to the 60s I think or 70s Thank you. you mean on 19th Street oh Julian just one second you're muted sorry mm -hmm. you're so muted. could you hear me it was um, the one on 62nd Street, and it was 230, uh -huh. number 230. So right now, I don't see any more raised hands. Um, so I'll just say one thing, in case this piques your interest. Um, I, the, the, my book is now out of print, but I have a, a, a stack of them. And when it was published, it was way too expensive. Um, I think it was selling for $75, but I have a stack of them that, that if anybody's interested, I'm happy to sell them at cost, which is $30. Uh, so if you get in touch with me or if you get in touch with friends um, and they'll send, they'll, they'll um, forward your request to me and you know, Susan DeVries just held up her book. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'd be happy to, to, uh, to get them sent to you. All right. I am getting a lot of messages right now about book purchases. So you can just reply to the email that I sent earlier and I'll forward them all to Andrew. And Charles is asking if Andrew will sign the books too. I'd be happy to. All right. 
Well, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for those who were um, patient enough to let us deal with our Zoom problems. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for such a wonderful lecture as always. And we Good hope work. to see you guys uh, in any of our future events. Stay well. Bye, everyone. Thank you.